Let's go ahead and dive into the Azure portal. Assume that you have a server application that you probably want to migrate to the cloud. One of the most straightforward ways of doing this is to move the application on the virtual machine to Azure. There will be different ways to interact with Azure. So you got Azure portal that runs on the browser, so you do not have to install anything to use it. Alternatively, you can install the CLI, which is the command line interface, or you can use the Azure PowerShell or the SDK, which stands for the Software Development Kit. If you want to use the command-based interface and you have a lot of experience with PowerShell, then that's probably your best bet. Otherwise, use the CLI, which is much easier than the PowerShell. It's actually possible to use CLI and PowerShell from inside the browser too. Of course, once you're logged into the Azure portal, you will have the options to toggle between CLI and PowerShell. And that means that you do not have to install anything on your desktop. And I'll show that to you in a minute. The SDK is what you need to use if you're going to add code in your application in order to interact with Azure. It's even possible to interact with Azure from a mobile device by using the Azure mobile app. You can even use the CLI and PowerShell from the mobile app. The easiest way to get started though is the Azure portal. So if you're going to follow along in this course, you need to have a subscription to portal.azure.com and that's where most of the work will happen. As you see, I'm already logged on to the Azure portal. I've got the dashboard where my existing resources are shown up right there. Let's go ahead and understand how you can create a VM and navigate through the portal. Now the easiest way to search for the resource is by hitting the search box here and typing in your resource. In this case, what I want to create is a virtual machine. So there I'm gonna type virtual machine. There you go. The first one that pops up here is the virtual machine. Now all you gotta do is click on add. There's another way to do the same thing. You can expand this and then hit the virtual machines. It's going to take you to the same place. And once you're here, you click on the add button. Microsoft provides really intuitive way of creating resources. In this case, we've got to follow along the wizard to set up the values for the subscription resource group. And under the disk section, you've got to set up the kind of disk you want, networking, management. And then once you have set up all of these values, you will then click on review and create to validate the settings. Let's go ahead and do that. I'll click on basics and the first option is the subscription. I've got two subscriptions in my account, the prod and learn IT. But let's understand what a subscription is. Usually it always sets to your default one. So we will usually leave the way it is, but I will explain what a subscription is. When you sign up for an Azure account, Microsoft creates both a billing account and a subscription. It's very easy to get mixed up with both of these because both are involved in billing. A billing account is an agreement that you or your organization sign to use Microsoft services. A subscription, on the other hand, is actually just a collection of Azure resources. But all of the resources in a subscription are on the same monthly bill. So it's a unit of billing. So why do you need to have both billing account and a subscription? Well, you might want to have multiple subscriptions in your billing account. Since each subscription generates a separate invoice, it can be useful to have a separate subscription for each department in your organization. Also, since the resources in different subscriptions are isolated from each other, you might want to have multiple subscriptions for security or compliance reasons. Okay, so we'll leave the subscription as default one and now it's asking for the resource group. Now what is a resource group? A resource group is a collection of resources, but a subscription can have multiple resource groups. So it's a way of further grouping the resources within a subscription. There are a variety of ways to divide resources into resource groups. But the best practice is to group related resources together, such as virtual machines and its associated storage account. So we're going to keep whatever is related to that application into that same resource group. Generally speaking, the resources in a group should be created and deleted at the same time, which makes sense if they are components that work together to provide a solution. All right, so let's create a resource group to hold this VM. 
and I'm going to call it as, let's say, dev-rg, which stands for the Development Resource Group. I'm going to click on OK. The next thing is where we decide in which region the VM should go in. Of course, I'm going to type in the virtual machine name. Let's say call it as web server and then the region. Microsoft has data centers in every continent except Antarctica. Now, each of these dots is a region and each region contains multiple Azure data centers. You usually want to choose a region that is closest to where your users are located. Now, I will choose East US from this drop down menu. If you're finding difficulty finding East US 2 in this drop down menu, you can just go ahead and type it here as well. So that's East US 2. There is a concept of availability zones, which I will explain that as well in a minute. Now, you need to have a set of availability for the virtual machines so that the application is available even if Microsoft Azure experiences an outage that affects the virtual machine. So the first option here is the availability zone, which is what I just showed on the map. And then there's a region that supports these availability zones. A region that supports availability zones has at least three data centers and what we call it as a zone. If you put VMs in multiple zones, then a data center outage won't take down your application because your VMs in other zones are still running. It added another field called as availability zone, so we can choose one, two, or three. It really doesn't matter which one we choose for this VM. It really doesn't matter which one we choose for this VM. But if we create a second VM, we would need to put it in a different availability zone. I will choose one. Next, we need to choose a VM image. What is an image? This is a copy of the disk that will be used for the VM. The choices are different. So you got Linux as well as Windows operating systems. You got different flavors of Linux. So you got Ubuntu, Oracle Linux, Debian, CentOS, SUSE, and Red Hat. This is only a subset of images that are available in this drop down. If you click on this link, you can see a lot more set of images that are available from what's called as a marketplace. For example, if you want an image that consists of not only the Windows operating system, but also SQL, then you can scroll down to the databases section and then type SQL here. Surprisingly, there are images of SQL Server on Linux first, but then as you scroll down to the bottom, you'll also see the ones related to Windows. But as you see, in the marketplace, you can find the images with a particular application that you're looking for. But for now, I will just go ahead and close this and select the Ubuntu operating system as it is. When you're doing the labs along with me, feel free to pick and choose the image that you want. There's an option for spot instance as well. If you use an Azure spot instance for this virtual machine, then the cost will dramatically be lower. But the VM might be shut down with only 30 seconds notice. So you should only use this option for non-critical workloads. With Azure Spot instances, you can go ahead and set your own price, what you want to pay for that particular VM. There are lots of options when it comes to selecting the size of the VM. At the top of the list, there is a size with just one virtual CPU and half a gig of memory and four gigs of temporary storage. And this one has four gigs of temporary storage. So you can see that the cost per month is also very low. Some of these other options are much bigger and thereby the cost is also directly proportional. So we are not going to use the size of the VM, but I will choose the cheapest one as this is just a demonstration. Here, we need to create an administration account. So I will choose password based authentication and fill in the credentials. Please note that you will not be able to use any well-known usernames like administrator, admin, or root is not allowed to be used as username. You might have already noticed that there is another option called as SSH public key, and you might want to choose this as well for authenticating to the VM. But since this is just a demo, I will use a password and then move on to the section where you can select the ports. The inbound ports here lets you open up the VM to access from the internet. If this VM will be acting as a web server, let's say, then you might want to open port number 
80 and 443. There's also an option to open the SSH port so that you can log into the VM remotely. The problem with opening the SSH port here is that it will allow access from all internet addresses, which is dangerous. There are other more secure ways to give yourself access to the VM, so you should select this only for testing purposes. And that's it for the basic settings in this wizard. Since I've selected all the options appropriately, I'll hit the next option to move further. And let's take a look at the disk section. Okay, the operating system is set to premium SSD by default. And this option here gives you the highest performance, but is also much more expensive than the other two. I will set it to standard. Please note that you can add multiple disks here. So that will be acting as your D drive or E drive. And now let's take a look at the networking options. By default, it creates a network for you, as well as the subnets that the VM requires. If you have already created a virtual network, you can go ahead and select that from the drop down menu. But in my case, I do not have the virtual network in the East US2 region, and hence it's creating a new network configuration. All right, since all of this is put together, I will hit the next button to go to the management section. So far, we have created the compute section under basics, the disk and networking. And now it's time to see how much of monitoring do you need for the VM and where would you like to store it? Would you like to integrate that with your managed identities in Azure Active Directory? Do you want automatic shutdown? Do you want to have backups enabled? Yes or no is what we can select here. In the advanced section, you have the extensions where you can select the agents required for monitoring your VM, antivirus as well, and there is an option to select the custom script extension. So if you have a script created and you would like that script to be executed during the VM provisioning, you can browse and select that script. The next option is the tags, which is very important for cost management and identifying who the owner is. For example, you can specify the owner as, let's say, Rob. So that will be the owner of the VM. And it's always better to have email addresses set up in the value field. Similarly, you can have multiple key value pairs set up in the tags to understand the metadata of the VM in future. Now that we are done with all of these fields, let's go ahead and validate this configuration by clicking on review and create. Looks like the validation is complete. I will hit create to start provisioning the VM. Now I will pause the video for a minute because the provisioning of VM takes about four to seven minutes depending on the kind of VM that you're creating. All right, the VM is created. Let's click on go to resource to take a look at our VM. As you notice, there is a public IP assigned to this VM. So I can definitely use this as a source. So I'll just copy that and then launch tool called putty and paste it here and click on open. And now, as you see, it is asking for the login prompt. So I can go ahead and type root admin here, which was my username and then the password. If I type it correctly, it will let me log into the VM. And the only reason I got connected from my VM is because I've got port number 22 as an inbound rule onto the VM under the networking section. As you see, there are lots of other options. You can see the VM status that this is running, and there's a public IP which we use to connect to the VM, and there are certain controls on the top to stop and restart and capture the image and then delete the VM as well. Inside this menu, there are other options as well, like the activity log, which tells us what has happened to this VM for auditing purposes. Then there is security, backup, and monitoring, and there are lots of options that you can do and interact with the VM. All right, that's it for the demo, and you should have a pretty good idea of how simple it is to create resources in the Azure portal. And regardless of what Azure resources you are creating, the processes will still be the same. That means you go to the Azure portal, find the resource like Load Balancer, App Services, SQL Databases, etc. Click on New, and then follow along the wizard along with these field values. When you're done, make sure that you delete the VM so that you do not incur any ongoing charges. And it's very easy to delete the VM as well. The best way to delete everything associated with the VM, including the public IP address, is to go ahead and delete the resource groups. 
So you can navigate to the resource group, identify the resource group where your VM is, and then click on the delete resource group button. Okay, so that should be deleted. It's going to delete the VM along with everything that it created in the backend. Now, if you're ready to see how to work with Azure using the CLI, let's go ahead and connect in the next video. Thanks for watching so far, and I'll see you in the next lesson.